Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on cis loop ligand gated ion channels. In this video, what we're going to talk about is slow channel myasthenic syndrome, also just known as slow channel syndrome. Okay, but its full and proper name is slow channel, and then it's got this word myasthenic, uh, which means any condition that causes muscle weakness, uh, and then it's syndrome slow channel myasthenic syndrome, although you will often hear this just referred to as slow channel syndrome. Right, so basically slow channel myasthenic, myasthenic syndrome is a disease involving uh, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So what we uh, so specifically the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which are on the skeletal muscle uh, cells. So what we're going to start off with is a revision of the structure of the neuromuscular junction and of uh, the neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Then what we're going to do is um, we're going to discuss what happens in slow channel myasthenic syndrome and um, how that leads to muscle weakness. Right, okay, so let's start off by having a revision of the structure of the neuromuscular junction. Right, so the neuromuscular junction is just like a synapse, except a synapse is between one neuron and another neuron, whereas the neuromuscular junction is a neuron coming onto a muscle cell membrane. So, uh, in this case, the presynaptic entity is a neuron, but the postsynaptic uh, structure is not a neuron, it's instead a skeletal muscle cell. So here is the cell membrane of the skeletal muscle cell here, okay, and uh, the cell membrane of a skeletal muscle cell is often referred to as the sarcolemma. In fact, that goes for any type of muscle cell, whether it's a skeletal muscle cell, or a cardiac muscle cell, or uh, a smooth muscle cell. Okay, so, basically, uh, this neuron here with its axon terminal interfaced with the sarcolemma is an alpha motor neuron, okay? Uh, and it's going to innovate the smooth muscle, sorry, not the smooth muscle cell, the skeletal muscle cell um, here. Okay, now, when it uh, fires an action potential, the action potential will make its way along the axon and then propagate into the axon terminal, and this will cause the release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. So you're going to release acetylcholine, and the shorthand for acetylcholine is ACH. So let me write the name of that up here. So acetylcholine. The acetylcholine will diffuse across this gap between the uh, membrane of the axon terminal and the membrane of the uh, target uh, skeletal muscle cell, which is known as the synaptic cleft, usually at least in synapses. I suppose you might call it something different, actually, since we're talking about the neuromuscular junction, but I think you can still refer to this as the synaptic cleft. Uh, so it's going to diffuse across this gap between uh, the presynaptic membrane and the sarcolemma, and then it's going to activate receptors on the um, sarcolemma um, membrane. Okay, and these receptors are nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So let me draw one of these here. So I'll just draw it very simply as a structure with a pore down the middle in this two-dimensional diagram. But I'll draw it in more detail in a moment. So this in turquoise here, this is the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay. So this is a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And you'd refer to this as an NACHR for short. So this stands for nicotinic is the N, ACH then stands for acetylcholine, and then R for receptor. Okay, so I suppose I should at least write this out in full once. So nicotinic um, acetylcholine receptor. Now, even though this is a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. The form of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is on uh, the sarcolemma of skeletal muscle cells, is not actually sensitive to nicotine, thank goodness. Uh, if it was, every time you smoked or every time you uh, took a dose of nicotine, 
And what would happen is uh, you would get activation of these receptors on your skeletal muscle cells, and it would cause involuntary contractions of your skeletal muscle. And if that happened in your diaphragm, you can imagine that it may well lead to problems with your breathing, and it could well be fatal. Okay, so nicotine is not an agonist at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors that are at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so uh, what happens then when the acetylcholine binds to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is that it opens and allows uh, sodium ions to move into the cell, okay, and these sodium ions carry a positive charge, so what this does is it depolarizes the electrical potential difference across the sarcolemma, and that prepares uh, the sarcolemma for firing and action potential, basically. Well, it will make it more likely that the sarcolemma generates an action potential. Okay, so it would function basically as an excitatory postsynaptic current, EPSC. Okay, and this is quite simply because you are bringing in uh, charge into the uh, cell. So there's a movement of charge across the membrane through this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. When you move charge, that's a current, so, and this is going to excite uh, the, post, the sarcolemma membrane, so it's an excitatory postsynaptic, because you're on the um, postsynaptic entity, uh, current, on EPSC um, for short, excitatory postsynaptic current. Okay, right, so now what we'll do is we will um, study this uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor in a bit more detail because it's in the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor at the neuromuscular junction that we are going to have the problem which occurs in slow channel myasthenic syndrome. Okay, uh, and by the way, when you get the action potential firing along the uh, sarcolemma, that's what triggers the uh, myofiber to contract basically. So, Overall, the alpha motor neuron releases acetylcholine, activates the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which causes an action potential, and that leads to contraction. Now, let's study this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor in a bit more detail. So let's take it out um, and have a look at it. So I'll draw it much larger here. So this here is the phospholipid bi there. Okay, so this is what previously I just drew as one line to represent the cell membrane, but I'm now drawing as two separate lines because it has the inner and outer leaflet of phospholipids. Okay, and sitting in the phospholipid by there, you have the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor here. Okay, and then the phospholipid by there continues on the other side over there. Now, uh, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is a ligand-gated ion channel, okay, and specifically it's a form of ligand-gated ion channel known as a cis-loop ligand-gated ion channel. Now, to be a ligand-gated ion channel means that when a ligand such as acetylcholine binds to you, you will open and allow ions to move through. That's what it means to be a ligand-gated ion channel. And ligand-gated ion channel is often abbreviated to LGIC for short. What the cis loop stands for, I'll show you in a moment. So, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are pentameric receptors. They are not just one protein, they are five proteins all bound together. So, like so. So they form this um, cartwheel-like shape here. So you have one, two, three, four, five separate proteins all coming together to make uh, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And this is for all nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And as we'll see, there are many different types of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. The one at the neuromuscular junction is the one we're interested in, but there are a huge number of different forms of this type of receptor. So, now let's study the structure of one of these proteins that makes up a fifth of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So let's pull out one of these subunits, as it's called, of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and have a look at its structure. So, if we draw the phospholipid by there again here and look at the uh, membrane-spanning topology of this protein, then what we have over here, let's say, is the amino terminus of the protein. Then you have 
a loop in the protein structure which is held together by disulfide bonds between cysteine amino acids. That's known as the cis loop. Then it has these um, four membrane spanning alpha helices, known as M1 is the first membrane spanning alpha helix, M2 is the second membrane spanning alpha helix, it then loops back over to form M3, the third membrane spanning alpha helix. It then has a large loop between the third and the fourth membrane spanning alpha helices, known as the intracellular loop. It then has the fourth membrane spanning alpha helix and the C terminus over here. So this is the structure of uh, a single one of these subunits that makes up a fifth of the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, so to divide it up into its distinct portions, the four membrane spanning alpha helices, M1, M2, M3, and M4 here, those make up the transmembrane region of the receptor. So this is the TMR for short, the transmembrane region. Okay, then this portion between the M3 alpha helice and the helix and the M4 alpha helix, uh, this is known as the intracellular loop here, or also called the M3 M4 loop. Okay, uh, but more commonly called the intracellular loop. And this makes up the intracellular domain of the uh, receptor. So this is the intracellular loop. Okay, and then finally, this bit that's pre-M1, i.e. prior to the M1 port alpha membrane spanning alpha helix, this makes up the extracellular domain. So this is on the extracellular side of the receptor, and I should have labelled that up, actually. This is the extracellular fluid over here, and this is the cytoplasm, and it's the same for this picture here. Okay, this is the extracellular fluid, and this is the cytoplasm. Right. Now, they are called cis loop receptors because of this loop that they have on their extracellular domain, which is a loop in the protein structure hold, held together by uh, cysteine amino acids that form a disulfide bond. So I'll expand on that more in the next video.